Um, so for the call to worship, um, I'd like to invite you to join with me in a responsive reading. So I will be reading the white print and I would ask that the congregation join in reading the green print. Lord, we thank you for the mentors in our lives. For those who lead us to follow you. You have planted us like a seed in a family, in a community, in a world, and sent gardeners to tend to us. May they guide us to grow in wisdom, like a tree rooted in you. Lord, we thank you for those in our lives who look to us. May we share your hope, your promises, and your love with those that we love. May we be of integrity, listening to your voice as we guide others. Lord, may we be sheep of your pasture, followers of your truth. We pray we will be shepherds, even to those who we do not know us. May we learn to see these others. May we learn to see their needs. May we feel others' hurts. Grant us the means to ease them. May we witness others searching. Grant us the grace to guide them lovingly. Lord, it is not more of us that they need. It is more of you. So let us be reflections of you rather than obstructions blocking you from sight. Enable me to be. May the living water of your love overflow like a flooding river from us to those you have created in your image. Amen. And I'll invite the worship team to come up and lead us in singing. Good morning. We invite you to stand to sing with us. We're going to sing two songs. Come now is the time to worship and great is thy faith in us.
Time now for a children's story. So, Mr. Frank Buchert is going to lead the story today. And if you are a child or a child at heart, feel free to come up and join him at the front. Okay, good morning guys, how are you doing? Good? Here, I have a little story written down and I'm just going to read it to you guys, okay? Once upon a time in a quaint village nestled amidst rolling hills and colorful meadows, there lived a young boy named Timothy. He was a kind-hearted and curious child, always eager to explore and learn about the world around him. Timothy had a special place in his heart for the garden behind his house where he would spend hours playing and watching plants grow. One sunny morning, while walking through the garden, Timothy discovered a tiny seed lying on the ground. It was so small that he almost missed it. Timothy picked it up and gently picked it up gently and wondered, "What kind of seed are you, little one, and where do you belong?" As he pondered, a wise old gardener named Mr. Smith approached Timothy with a warm smile. Mr. Pr- Mr. Smith was known for his vast knowledge of plants and gardening. He said, "Ah, Timothy, I see you found a little seed. Each seed has its own destiny, waiting to blossom into something beautiful. Would you like to know more about this seed?" Timothy nodded eagerly, and Mr. Smith continued, "This seed is special. It has potential to grow into a mighty tree, providing shade and shelter to many creatures in the forest. But for..." But for for it to fulfill its destiny, it needs care, patience, and the right conditions. Timothy's eyes sparkled with excitement, and he asked, "How can I help become a, How can I help it become a big, strong tree?" Mr. Smith handed Timothy a small pot and showed him how to fill it with rich, fertile soil. Timothy gently placed the seed into the pot and watered it every day. He watched over it with love and devotion, making sure it had enough sunlight and protection from the harsh weather. As the days turned into weeks and weeks into months, Timothy marveled at the little seed's transformation. It began to sprout tender green shoots, reaching towards the sky. Timothy knew that with perseverance, the seed would become the mighty tree Mr. Smith had described. One afternoon, while taking a break from his gardening duties, Timothy found himself reading a letter from his favorite book, the Bible. It was a letter written by a wise and caring man named Paul, addressed to Timothy himself. In the letter, Paul encouraged Timothy to be strong and keep growing in his faith and knowledge. Paul wrote, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is, hard-working far- it is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything." Timothy found inspiration in these words. He realized that just as the little seed, he needed to be patient, persevere through challenges, and keep growing in the faith and understanding. He understood that he could achieve great things if he followed the path of the righteousness and stayed true to his beliefs. 
With renewed determination, Timothy continued to care for the growing sapling, knowing that each step was a reminder of the valuable lessons he had learned from the little seed. As time passed, the sapling transformed into a magnificent tree, just as Mr. Smith had foretold. The tree provided shade and shelter, just as it had meant to do. Birds nested in its branches, and animals found comfort in its shade during the hot summer days. The little seed had grown into a symbol of strength, perseverance, and faith. And so, little children, the story of Timothy and the little seed teaches us that from that with faith, love, and determination, we can overcome any obstacle and grow into something extraordinary, just like that little seed had become a mighty tree. Like Timothy, let us be strong and always eager to learn and steadfast in our beliefs, beliefs so we may grow to be the best versions of ourselves. Thank you. I invite you to stand and we'll sing a couple more songs. The first song we're singing here is called Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. It will be familiar to some of you. It's based on Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing with a little bit extra added. So sing where you wish.
this time um, we'll read from scripture. So I'll be reading from 2 Timothy, verse, sorry, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, and chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. So from chapter 1 first. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And from chapter 2. Then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, to entrust to faithful men who who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we had died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Um, And I'd ask now to um, bow with me in congregational prayer, um, and I'll leave a short moment of silence in the middle of the prayer for you to bring your own concerns and reflections to God, and then I will close the prayer after that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for our friends, our neighbors, and family in Christ, whom we have the privilege of worshiping with this morning. Take from our hearts all selfishness, jealousies, and possessiveness. May we seek to give and to seek help when we find ourselves in despair. Keep us open to your love, that we may reflect it to those around us. Lord, strengthen us, that we may strengthen others. Kindle in our hearts a love for you and for your children, so that our lives are witnesses of your mercy and goodness and grace. Help us to stand in trust of your Holy Spirit, to establish your unchanging love in this changing, tumultuous world. Comfort our hearts where we grieve, and move our hearts to find joy where you find joy. Father, hear our burdens and receive our praises as we lay them before you this morning.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you have brought us here together. Thank you, to the, thank you for those you have sent into our lives to guide us and to walk alongside us. Thank you too for sending us to others. We pray that you would grant us wisdom to know when to speak, when to simply listen, and when to act to assist others on their journey. Give us understanding hearts as well as teachable spirits as we listen to Joe's words this morning and as we take those words with us into the coming days. Thank you for Joe's willingness to share and to come to our assembly this morning. And bless both the speaker and the listeners as we join together in fellowship. Amen. I'll invite Joe to come forward at this time. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate the preparation that's come together in this service that's made it so clear that uh, there, there's a unified message being communicated. Uh, when we hit the parking lot this afternoon, I'm confident we will all have the same message on our hearts and that we will be living differently and we'll be changed according to that. And I just, uh, yeah, between the children's story and the responsive reading, it's been it's really been great to hear that. Um, before we get started, I do want to give you a quick heads up, um, because as is true to my character, I'm going to throw a little uh, stick in the, s the spoke of your bike here. Um, in about 10 minutes or so, I'm going to have a discussion question, and so I'm going to ask that you're going to turn to your neighbors. Um, it's going to maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable, but that's why I'm giving you the 10 minute warning. You can mentally prepare yourself. And uh, then we're going to have one more towards the end of the message as well. So just get ready for that. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Joe, as it said before. Uh, Joe Martins, that's my wife, BJ, over there. And there's a picture of us, I think, if you are far away and you can't see us. Oh, I have the clicker. Hey, there we go. That's me and BJ. Uh, we live here in Coldale. She's a teacher at Jenny Emery, and I'm uh, the youth pastor at the MB Church down the road. Um, we love dogs. This is our little puppy currently, little moose. Um, we enjoy hiking and camping, uh, although we're kind of taking a break from tenting right now because uh, just based on the number of grizzly bears that have walked through our campsite recently, we're just kind of, you know what, maybe tenting is not for us right now. Uh, we enjoy getting on the water, kayaking, paddle boarding, struggling to keep our dog inside the boat instead of jumping into the water. Um, that's been a, a good experience. I personally like fantasy books, I like superhero movies, I like volleyball and disc golf, and I like youth ministry. Um, I've been involved consistently in youth ministry for the last nine years. Five of those have been volunteering and leading small groups and worship and other capacities, and then four of those have been on staff in some, some way. The last three years I've been on staff at the MB Church, as I said before, and this morning I want to talk a little bit about at least in general terms, youth ministry. Um, I want to make myself really, really clear, though, about something that I really, truly believe, and that is our responsibility as the church is to minister faithfully to the young people that God has put into our lives. What I'm not talking about this morning, and I want to make this really, really clear, is I'm not talking about midweek youth programs or Sunday school or I'm not talking about how many teenagers fill the pew on a Sunday morning or what those things look like because those are only methods of getting to the goal. I'm saying that each and every one of us will encounter young people that God has put in our path and it is our responsibility to pass on our faith to that next generation. And that can look like young kids and teenagers and young adults. It's a broad, when I say youth ministry, I really mean a broad uh, picture there. And so this morning we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy and we're going to examine the relationship between Paul and Timothy. And we already read from, from the scripture that I'm going to be pulling from, but um, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, that's the key verse here. And if that is the call for us to pass on our faith, to take what we've been taught and pass it on so they can then pass it on. And if that's where you want to check out and if that's what you want to take from this morning and you want to just close your eyes and start daydreaming, but you memorize 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, I would be okay with that. And you can take that and that would be great. 
But if you want to dive a little bit deeper and if you want to take your calling to pass on this faith to the next generation a little bit more serious, a little bit more deep, then I would like to really look at the relationship between Paul and Timothy. Because as we read through these letters, specifically the second letter today, um, yeah, we're going to see that the way that Paul relates to Timothy is huge. It's hugely important. And so I want us to really consider how we apply this biblical teaching that Paul gives us while we explore the theme of mentoring a younger believer. And so let me pray, and then let's get right into it. God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word, Lord, that my words would be of you, that anything that I need not say, you would take from my lips, that anything that I'm missing, you would put there and you would speak through me. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to hear from your Holy Spirit this morning. In your name, amen. Okay, so in April, BJ and I, we took a, right, I got the clicker. Hey, come on. Success. Thanks, Bill. In April, BJ and I took a group of high school students to a youth retreat in Saskatchewan. And when I go to these things, I usually try to make it to one of the youth worker seminars if I have a chance, just to kind of get some own investment into my own life, and as opposed to just staying up all night and, and working with teenagers. Um, and this, it worked, and so I signed up for an early morning breakfast session with a, with a youth worker trainer, um, which can I just say was actually kind of a bad deal, because while the kids were getting like sausage and bacon and pancakes, I showed up to the youth worker session, it's like cold cereal and not that good coffee, so... I'm not a complainer, but uh, I thought maybe at least we get the same food as the kids, not just the worst version, but that was okay. Um, and in this session, a stat was brought up, and it was, it was from a research project done by the youth worker community uh, in partnership with some other organizations, I believe, and they found that after graduating high school um, and being in a, second, a secular post-secondary for one year, only 35% of evangelical young adults, so people who grew up in the church, um, remained engaged in their faith community. 35%. And that might be kids who are going to youth programs in Sunday school and in the pews on Sunday morning, all that good stuff. However, those who could articulate at least one mentor, one person who invested in them as they grew up, that put their time and energy into their life, that told them, you are more than just a program to me, that number more than doubled. So over 70% of those who could articulate a mentor remained committed to their faith. And so I hope it's dawning on you that the way that we do discipleship is extremely important. And mentorship is incredibly important. And so let's open to 2 Timothy and let's explore what it looks like as Paul writes to Timothy. Verse 1, chapter 1, 1 to 2. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I've been sent out to tell others about the life he's promised through faith in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. So right away we notice that Paul has a strong relationship with Timothy. He calls him my dear son, in other versions, uh, other translations, my beloved son. There's a closeness that goes beyond co-workers. Um, it goes beyond just missionaries kind of doing the same mission and going in the same direction. They are relationally connected. They are friends. There's a sense of even a parental relationship. Verse 3, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Okay, so I want you to think about the people who you pray for. The people that every day you go to God and you say, I want what's best for them. God, I want your will to be done in their lives. I want your blessing to be over them, and I want them to be faithfully following you. Paul is consistently and intentionally praying for Timothy in this way. Night and day. Verse 4, I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I, will, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. So I was listening to a podcast a number of, uh, probably months ago now, 
Um, and it gave me a bit of a, a new understanding of some of these verses that Paul writes in the beginning of his letters. Uh, Jason Ballard with the Canadian Church Leadership Network, he was interviewing a pastor, uh, Albert Chu, pastor of Tapestry Church in Richmond, BC. And they were discussing church planting because I guess that was the topic of the episode. And, and it's great and good and Tapestry has been doing this wonderful ministry with church planting. And they started to talk a little bit about the pain that comes from church planting. Because guess who has to establish and lead the new church that you're so celebratory over opening? It's the people on the other half of this sanctuary right here. I want everyone in this half of the sanctuary right now to look over to the people over there and vice versa. Everyone look over there. This group is going to Ontario tomorrow morning. Okay, just imagine. Look at every face. They're going, and they're not coming back because they're going to do God's work, and they're going to plant a church over there. But guess what? You are not going to see them next Sunday, and you are not going to see them driving down the road and walking down the street, and you're not going to see them at the grocery store. You're not going to see them at Christmas or Easter or any of these special events because they are leaving. And it's wonderful, right? Something we take joy in. But you can see why Paul writes, I long to see you. I cried when we, when we parted. I had tears. I miss you. I can't wait to see you again. They are close. They are not just co-workers. Paul is not a CEO talking to an employee. He is a friend. So the first characteristic of this mentorship that we see is that it's planted on a foundation of relationship. Paul knew Timothy. He knew what was going on in his life. He prayed for him. He knew his family. He knew him like a son, like a student, and like a friend. Mentorship is grounded in relationship. And so, I'm going to get you to turn to someone who's sitting next to you. Or even someone who's in a different pew. Maybe someone who you didn't come here this morning with. Maybe a group of four. And I want to ask you the question. Just take two minutes. Make sure you have a chance to share and you have a chance to listen. Have you had someone in your life who invested in this type of relationship with you? So go ahead and do that now. All right, I'm going to try to rein you back in. Uh, I encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to discuss more, um, do it in the foyer after the service. What a great conversation to have to discuss the people who've invested in your life. That's something you can always talk about. Um, okay, let's keep reading in verse 5. 
I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that same faith continues strong in you. Okay, so Paul, out of his relationship, he knows Timothy and he knows something about him. He sees something in him. He saw a genuine faith that wasn't just a show, that wasn't just fake and on the outside. As we've read so many times in Paul's letters, he has this incredible ability to call out the false believers and those who remain truly following Jesus. He can recognize the difference between a real fake faith and one that's fake. And Paul is saying, Timothy, I see in you a genuine faith. I see how you've come to believe. I see how it came from your parents. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. I see your faith and how you've learned it from your family, but now you've got to make it your own. Verse 6 and 7, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So Paul is inviting Timothy to stoke this burning faith. He's saying, look, you've got something. You've got something amazing, an incredible gift. You've got to grow it. You've got to stoke it. You've got to invest into it. You've got to do the work of growing this, this garden within you. Uh, the NLT version that I'm reading, uh, it, it says spiritual gift. But most other versions say just the gift of God. And so... While it's still possible that, that this verse could be referring to like a specific spiritual gift, most commentaries would say that it's more likely talking about the gift of salvation. And I think whatever it happens to be, whether it's talking about a spiritual gift or the general gift that God has offered to us all, I think our, our, the message is still clear and our response is still the same. Take your faith and do something with it. Take your ability to lead and do something with it. Take your teaching gift and do something with it. Take your unimaginably unfair gift of grace and do something with it. Don't let it burn low, hidden inside. Let it drive you. Let it inform your actions. Let it change the way that you actually live in the world outside of these walls. 2 verse 2. You've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Right, this is this pivotal verse. You've learned it. You've received it. Pass it on. This is where the rubber hits the road. Paul is saying, go do it now. Now, now go take it. You've heard the truth, now go pass it on. It's not just for you to keep, like your faith burning within you, it's not just for yourself. You've got to be willing to step out and to pass it on. And so Paul encouraged Timothy in his faith. He helped him to see his roots. He spurred him on. He reminded him to use his gift for the gospel, to grow it, to stoke the flame that was burning within him. Timothy, Timothy's faith was genuine from the get-go, but sometimes it takes an outside voice to just remind you and encourage you and to get you to grow it. And so mentorship, as we read here, is helping someone to grow in their faith and in their calling. 2 Timothy 2, 3-10. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. Always remember that, Christ, that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the, from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal, but the word of God cannot be chained. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. Paul gives a few examples here. Each metaphor, each story here, is a, there's a goal 
and a sacrifice that needs to get there. Each of these people, they need to put something aside and they need to lay something down in order to get to the prize. It's going to cost them something. The soldier can please the officer, but it's, it, he has to make his duty his life. He can't go back to civilian life. The athlete can win the trophy, but only by being diligent and following the rules. And the farmer can enjoy his harvest only after putting in the hard work it takes to get there. Paul is saying, as messengers of the gospel, we're the same. There's a prize we're working towards, but the prize of seeing the lost It is the prize of seeing the lost find salvation and glory in Jesus Christ, but it's going to result in some suffering. It's going to cost some sacrifice. And so mentorship is gearing someone up for suffering. Because as we know, once someone decides to follow Jesus, their life does not become infinitely easier becomes more difficult. It is the narrow way. It still has challenges. It requires cost and sacrifice. And so to mentor someone is to prepare them for that. It's not to lie to them and say, oh, life is going to be so good. All your problems disappear. It's to prepare them and say, look, it's going to cost. Look, it's going to be challenging, but the prize is always worth it. Two verse 25 Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. As you and I both know, all know, uh, there are going to be people who oppose the truth. It's as real as it is today as it was in this time. We know this too well. We see it every single day in all sorts of arenas and stages and places of life. Paul is instructing Timothy to gently instruct the people who are opposing the gospel. And these two incredibly important things are incredibly easy to do each individually on their own. All right? Separately, being gentle is so easy. You just don't confront, you don't call anything out, you don't say anything, you just be kind all the time, and it's, it's good. You don't even have to You don't even have to to share that you're a Christian. It's easy. Just treat them gently. And instructing on its own, if you don't care about the person you're talking to, if you don't care about uh, your relationship between them, it's easy. You're right. You just tell them what's right. And you don't care if it hurts them. You point out every sin with a, a finger and you challenge and you call out. It's good. But doing them together... As Paul says, finding that balance between grace and truth, gently instructing, is where it gets tricky. But we have to live in that tension. We cannot swing to one side because it's, it's detrimental. Paul calls Timothy to teach the truth gently, and he says, but then perhaps God will change their hearts. We have a role in this. We are called to point those things out, but ultimately we rely on the Holy Spirit to change hearts. Paul calls Timothy to be filled with love and grace, but not to beat around the bush when the things come up that really count. When we're talking about the gospel, we need to share the truth. But again, ultimately, it's God who changes people, not us. Second Timothy three fourteen to seventeen, or jumping ahead a little bit. But you must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to what. Uh, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. 
So Paul's already said, look, you gotta, you got to tell the truth to people, Timothy, and this is where you find it. This is where you get it. Paul reminds Timothy where to find this truth with this incredibly important passage here. He's saying God's word is available to you. It's available to us. It's inspired by him. It teaches us right from wrong. It prepares us. It equips us to do good. And it's where we find truth. And so mentorship is guiding one, guiding someone towards that truth. Guiding them to to take hold of it and to preach it. And guiding them to where to even find it for their self. So this is what mentorship is. As we see from Paul in his relationship with Timothy. It's grounded in a relationship. It's helping someone grow in their faith and their calling. It's gearing them up for suffering and it's guiding them towards truth. And so again, I'm gonna ask you one last time to turn in your seats, find your buddy from last time or your group and um, just discuss this last question together and then we'll close shortly after. What's one way that you could help someone do one of these things? What's one practical way, someone in your life, that you could help them grow in their faith, gear up for suffering, or guide them towards some truth? So I'll let you do that now. Alrighty, I'll try to rein you in one more time. So here we find ourselves. Um, We've got a glimpse of what mentorship looks like for Paul and Timothy. This isn't an exclusive list, obviously, of what it looks like. Because I'm sure, I'm positive, we can find more examples of great relationships and great uh, aspects of what mentorship and discipleship should look like but in the book of second timothy we see an example of a faithful christian pouring out his love and his wisdom and his encouragement to a young leader to a young believer we see that paul has a solid personal personal relationship with timothy 
We see Paul encourage Timothy to grow in his faith and his calling. We see Paul gear him up for the suffering that awaits him. And we see him guide him towards the pursuit of truth. So then what I would ask you, and what I hope you will ask yourself, is what would it look like for you to take up this high calling in your own life? If you aren't already mentoring someone, then what, what's stopping you? And on the flip side, if you don't have a mentor, if you're pouring out and investing into others and you don't have someone to turn to, to bring your questions to, what's keeping you from tapping someone on the shoulder and asking? There's wisdom all around us. I'm just going to read 2 Timothy 2.2 again to close. Like I said, if that's all you take, then great. You've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to other others. Let me pray, and then we'll close in music, I believe. God, we thank you for your word again. We thank you for how it points us towards truth, how it shows us how to live. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, how you speak through it. God, we pray that you would show us how to take one practical step, how to take one of these things this morning and how to invest in the life of someone who's following Jesus, how to mentor someone, how to pour into them, whoever it may be that crosses our path, God. We'd be surprised who we see when you open our eyes. And so I pray that we would live according to that, that you would change us, that our hearts would look more like what you're calling us to be, and we would honor and glorify you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. I'm going to... I invite you to turn into your Hosanna books to number 30, Blessed Are They. We're going to sing that as our sending song. I invite you to stand, please.
Before the benediction, um, I'd just like to say a thank you to those who participated in today's service, um, to Joel and BJ for joining us this morning, to the worship team, to Frank, um, and to Bill and Tim for doing the sound in the media this morning. So thank you for those of you who participated. And for the benediction, I'd like to read um, a few verses from Hebrews 13. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Can you t continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering? So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Grace be with you all. Amen. <laughs>